On 12 September 1977, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa was dealt a heavy blow due to the death of Bantu Steve Biko, a popular voice of black liberation in South Africa between the mid-1960s until his death in police detention in 1977. Biko was one of the most prominent leaders in the anti-apartheid struggle and in some quarters he was seen as the most important black South African leader of his generation. He was so important in fact that the apartheid government was terrified of him. Bantu Steve Biko inspired a generation of black South Africans to claim their true identity and refuse to be part of their own oppression. Unfortunately, Steve Biko paid the ultimate price with his life. In this episode of African Biographics, we look at the life and legacy of Steve Biko, one of the stalwarts of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. The man known to history as Bantu Steve Biko was born in Tyoden in the Eastern Province, now Eastern Cape, on 18 September 1946. He was the third child of the late Muzinganya Matthew and Alice Nokuzola Biko. Muzinganya worked as a policeman and later as a clerk in the King Williamstown Native Affairs Office. Steve Biko's father Mzingaye was a very intelligent man and he was enrolled at the University of South Africa, the Distance Learning University, to get his law degree. Unfortunately, he did not complete enough courses to get his law degree before he died. In 1948, when Steve was just two years old, the family moved to Ginsburg Township, just outside of King Williamstown, in today's Eastern Cape. The Beakers eventually owned their house in Zaula Street in the Brownlee section of Ginsburg. This was despite Nokuzola's meager income as a domestic worker. Steve's father, Mzingaye, died suddenly in 1950 when the boy was only four years old and his mother subsequently raised the children on her own, working as a cook at Gray's Hospital. As Steve Beaker was growing up, his friends knew him as a joker. His primary school teacher remembered him as a naughty boy who was always barefoot. This was the same teacher that recommended that Steve skip a grade and be promoted to standard 5 because of his exceptional intelligence. Although his friends never saw him study, he was one of the brightest kids in the class and he would help the other kids grasp complex concepts taught in class. Steve passed standard 6 in 1959 and in 1960 he went on to Forbes Grant, a school through which many passed to become prominent figures in post-apartheid South Africa. While at Forbes Grant, Steve excelled in mathematics and English and in 1962, at the age of 16, Steve Biko completed his junior certificate. Now here's the thing, Steve Biko was growing up in apartheid South Africa and life was difficult for black people because of this system. Apartheid officially became a way of life in South Africa in 1948 when the Africana National Party came into power after heavily promoting the racially stratified system. Under apartheid, South Africans were categorized into four racial groups and these were the Bantus, who were the South African natives, the colored group, the white people, and then the Asians. Apartheid limited the education the Bantu received. Because apartheid laws reserved skilled jobs for white people exclusively, black people were trained in schools to perform manual and agricultural labor, but not for skilled trades. Despite being natives of South Africa, the black people in the country were relegated to 10 Bantu homelands after the passage of the promotion of Bantu Self-Government Act of 1959. The purpose of the law seemed to be divide and rule. By splitting up the black population, the Bantu could not form a single political unit in South Africa and wrestle control from the white minority. From 1961 to 1994, more than 3.5 million people were forcibly moved from their homes and placed in the Bantu stands, where they were plunged into poverty and hopelessness. During apartheid, black people were required to carry passbooks at all times to allow them entry into public spaces reserved for white people. This was the overall context in which Steve Biko was growing up and navigating life as a young man. In 1964, young Steve was offered a bursary to join his brother, Kaya, as a student at Lovedale, a prestigious boarding school in Alice, Eastern Cape. At the time, political tension at Lovedale was rife. Steve arrived at the school soon after Thabo Mbeki, a future South African president, had been expelled following strikes by students. 
The same fate of expulsion was going to befall Steve later. In April of 1964, Steve was taken into custody by the police who came to the school to arrest his brother Kaya. Kaya was suspected of being involved with an organization called POCO, the armed wing of the Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC, an African nationalist group which the government had banned. The police took both brothers to King Williamstown, which was 60 kilometers away, and Kaya Biko was charged. He was given a sentence of two years with 15 months suspended, and he served his term at Fort Glamorgan Jail near East London. Steve Biko was released and returned home. Despite there not being any clear evidence of Steve's connection to Pokro, he was expelled from Lovedale. This incident inculcated in Steve a strong resentment toward white authority, which would shape his political career. After being expelled from high school for political activism, Steve Biko enrolled at St. Francis College, a liberal boarding school in Natal province. The college had a liberal political culture and Biko developed his political consciousness there. While attending the school, he became particularly interested in the replacement of South Africa's white minority colonial government with an administration that represented the country's black majority. After matriculating from St. Francis with very good grades, Steve Biko went on to register for a degree in medicine at the black section of the medical school of the University of Natal in 1966. Steve lived in the Alan Taylor residence, the segregated living quarters for black students at Natal University. Very early in his time at the university, he showed an expansive search for knowledge that far exceeded his own medicine degree ending up as one of the most prominent student leaders on campus. The black section of this university had its own Students' Representative Council, which was a member of the National Union of South African Students, NUSAS. Steve was elected to the SRC in his first year and he became involved in NUSAS politics, attending the annual NUSAS conference for the first time. But even before he went to the conference, he was engaging in debates about the role of NUSAS. NUSAS had taken pains to cultivate a multiracial membership, but it remained white dominant simply because the majority of South Africa's university students were from the country's white minority. Steve Biko felt that NUSAS failed to represent the needs of black students, and the following is a glaring example of this. In the NUSAS conference of 1967, after the students arrived, they found that dormitory accommodation had been arranged for the white and Indian delegates, but not for the black Africans, who were told they could sleep in a local church. So appalling were the conditions that it showed the black students just how valued they were in the organization. The students were indeed fed and housed separately in accordance with the Separate Amenities Act. The Separate Amenities Act enforced segregation on all public facilities, including buildings and transport, in order to limit contact between the different races in South Africa. This act also stated that the facilities for different races did not need to be equal. In practice then, the best facilities were reserved for the white population, while those for the other races were inferior. At this particular NUSAS conference, the black students, including Steve Biko, were aggrieved at this treatment. Steve Biko later related that this event forced him to rethink his belief in the multiracial approach to political activism. Deeply dissatisfied with NUSAS, the now disillusioned Steve Biko, along with several of his colleagues, founded the South African Students' Organization, SASO. Steve Biko was elected the first president of this organization in his inaugural congress held at Turf Loop in 1969. Sasso was born out of the frustrations of black students encountered within the liberal and multiracial organization NUSAS. Sasso's clarion call was for black students to refrain from being spectators in a game in which they were ought to be participants. Sasso's primary engagement was to address the inferiority complex that was the mainstay of passiveness within the ranks of black students. It was not long before Sasso became the most formidable political force, spreading to campuses around the country and beyond. Sasso was involved in providing legal aid and medical clinics, as well as helping to develop cottage industries for disadvantaged black communities. <laughs> 
Inspired by Steve Biko's growing legacy, the youth of the country at high school level also mobilized themselves into a movement that became known as the South African Students' Movement. This movement would play a pivotal role in the 1976 Soweto uprising, which accelerated the course of the liberation struggle. During this period, Steve Biko and Sasso started sowing the seeds of the Black Consciousness Movement. This philosophy encouraged Blacks to recognize their inherent dignity and self-worth. But I'll touch on the Black Consciousness Movement in just a bit. From around 1970, Sasso's leaders were beginning to consider the limitations of organizations that were confined to just student members. Following these considerations, the idea of a broader community formation took root, one which would result in the launch of the Black People's Convention, the BPC. So in 1972, Steve Biko founded the BPC as an umbrella organization for the Black Consciousness Movement, which had begun sweeping through universities across the nation. Steve Biko was instrumental in the development and formation of a core SASO project, the Black Workers Project, which was co-sponsored by the Black Community Programs, for which Steve Biko worked at the time. The black community programs addressed the problems of black workers whose unions were not yet recognized by the law. As all of this was happening, on the academic side, Steve Biko initially did well in his university studies, but his grades gradually declined as he devoted increasing time to political activism. Six years after starting his degree, he found himself repeating his third year of studies. So in 1972, as a result of his poor academic performance, the University of Natal barred him from further study. After being excluded from medical school in 1972, Steve Biko joined the BCP at their Durban offices. The BCP engaged in a number of community-based projects and published a yearly journal called the Black Review, which provided an analysis of political trends in the country. Having given up on the idea of becoming a doctor, Steve Biko enrolled for various courses at the Distance Learning University, UNISA, and in 1973, he began studying law and political science, subjects that were more relevant to his political involvement. Bantu Steve Biko's political activism and engagement was underpinned by a philosophy which was to be known as the Black Consciousness Movement. Steve Biko's experiences under apartheid drove his philosophy and political activism. Growing up, he had witnessed political raids during his childhood and lived through the brutality and intimidation the apartheid government was known for. And so his philosophy of black consciousness focused primarily on liberating the minds of black people who had been relegated to an inferior status by white power structures. The Black Consciousness Movement viewed the liberation of the mind as the primary weapon in the fight for freedom in South Africa, defining Black Consciousness as first being an inward-looking process where Black people regain the pride stripped away from them by the apartheid system. In one of his many famous quotes, Steve Biko said, The first step, therefore, is to make the Black man to come to himself, to pump back life into his empty shell, to infuse him with pride and dignity, to remind him of his complicity in the crime of allowing himself to be misused and therefore letting evil reign supreme in the country of his birth. This is the definition of black consciousness. According to Steve Biko, a necessary step towards restoring dignity to black people entailed elevating the heroes of African history and promoting African heritage to deconstruct the idea of Africa being the dark continent. Black consciousness sought to extract the positive values within indigenous African cultures and make them a standard with which black people judge themselves. This would then be the first form of resistance towards imperialism and apartheid. In apartheid South Africa, black consciousness aimed to unite citizens under the main cause of their oppression. Steve Biko's charisma flowed outside of the university campuses and the Black Consciousness Movement became a phenomenon throughout the country of South Africa. The Black Consciousness Movement was becoming a presence in the country and not only at tertiary institutions. It was visible in the media, at schools and at community theatres. Now, as you can probably imagine, this movement did not go down well with the apartheid government and so they retaliated. 
Initially, the apartheid government did not see black consciousness as a real threat. Rather, the apartheid state believed that this philosophy of black people working on their own fitted well with his own philosophy of separate development which was embedded in his policy of apartheid. However, as Sasso's membership swelled and other black consciousness organizations grew in support, the apartheid state began to crack down on Steve Biko and other leaders of the black consciousness movement. In 1973, eight black consciousness leaders, including Steve Biko, were banned. This meant that for five years they were restricted to the area in which they lived and could not speak to or meet with more than one person at a time. This prevented them from attending political meetings and rallies. The government gave no reason for these bannings, but it was clear that they hoped to crush the black consciousness movement. By the end of 1973, more leaders had been banned and some placed under house arrest. Steve Biko was confined to the district of King Williamstown and he returned to Ginsburg and moved for a while into his mother's house, the address to which he was restricted by his banning order. With Steve working for the black community programs, earning a stipend, the family relied on the income of his wife Nsiki, who had been the main breadwinner for some time. But with the family's move to Ginsburg, the apartheid authorities ensured that Nsiki would not easily find a job and the family struggled to make ends meet. It was not long before his banning order was amended to restrict him from any association with the BCP and the office that he had established in Ginsburg. Despite his banning, the BCP office that he established did well, managing amongst other achievements to build a clinic and a creche, both of which were very popular with the people. Steve Biko was also instrumental in the founding of the Zimele Trust Fund in 1975, which was set to assist political prisoners and their families. However, the state security apparatus repeatedly sought to intimidate him. Steve Biko used to receive anonymous threatening phone calls and gunshots were regularly fired at his house. As a result, a group of young men calling themselves the Cubans began guarding him from these attacks. The security services detained him four times, once for more than a hundred days. Unfortunately for Bantu Steve Biko, his days were numbered and he was about to meet a brutal death at the hands of the apartheid regime. Black consciousness inspired many students in Soweto to take decisive action against their own oppression. After the Soweto Uprising of 1976, which began as a protest against the government's insistence that the Afrikaans language be used as the medium of instruction in Soweto's high schools, black consciousness was systematically targeted. Steve Biko being considered as the father of the black consciousness movement exacerbated this situation as he often ignored his banning orders in order to address crowds and to continue his work in the movement. On 17 August 1977, Steve Biko left Port Elizabeth and traveled with a man by the name Peter Jones to the Western Cape to attend a meeting. On their way back, they were stopped at a roadblock and were detained. This happened on the 21st of August 1977. Steve Biko was held at the eastern city of Port Elizabeth, where he was violently tortured and interrogated. He was imprisoned on charges of terrorism. By the 11th of September, he was found naked and chained to a prison cell door. He died in a hospital cell the following day as a result of brain injuries sustained at the hands of the police. Bantu Steve Biko was only 30 years old. The South African Minister of Police announced that he died after a seven-day hunger strike. An official inquest into Biko's death, despite evidence to the contrary, stated that his death could not have been brought about by any act or omission involving an offense by any person. Riots ensued in the aftermath of this statement and a few students were killed in the protest. 15,000 people showed up to Biko's funeral, including foreign dignitaries, African diplomats and about 13 Western diplomats. The governments of Ghana and Lesotho released official statements of outrage. The South African police had clearly underestimated the potential consequences of Steve Biko's death and a global movement emerged demanding justice for Steve Biko. Following his death in detention, Biko became officially the 46th victim of torture and death under the state security laws. His death helped highlight the brutality of the South African security laws to the international community and the general plight of black South Africans. <laughs>
It led directly to the decision by Western countries to support the United Nations Security Council vote to ban arms sales to the South African apartheid government. It was only many years later at the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that the truth of Steve Biko's death was revealed. In early 1997, four former police officers, including police colonel Gideon Newwood, appeared before the commission and admitted to killing Steve Biko two decades earlier. The commission agreed to hear their request for political amnesty, but in 1999 refused to grant them amnesty because the men failed to establish a political motive for the brutal killing of Steve Biko. Bantu Steve Biko was a giant of the struggle against South Africa's white minority rule and arguably its most famous martyr. Black consciousness was beyond a movement and Steve Biko's legacy remains one that is deeply relevant to this day, a legacy of resistance and self-determination in the face of widespread oppression. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.